Yeah. Cool. And we're live. There it is. <laughs> How's it going, guys? I'm Fernando Martinez. I'm Dave Frisco. And today we're going to try to help you choose a camera for film production. This, uh, we have a show called uh, Film Form, which you might have seen or might not here in uh, Adorama TV, so hopefully you can check that out. We have a couple of uh, episodes out already when we try to, you know, we shoot a scene, we shoot a, a production, and then, you know, kind of like tell you how we did it. Show you kind of behind the scenes. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, but today we're going to focus on helping you get, uh, you know, choose a camera for your specific production. Um, so let's start with like the basics. Uh, you, you, almost everybody that is involved in, in you know, production in any way um, has a access to something like a DSLR or mirrorless. So we're gonna be talking like the three types of, uh, we're gonna be covering three types of cameras from you know, the small mirrorless DSLR types to you know, your entry level professional cameras and, and, and more broadcast oriented. And then we're going to cover a little bit of, uh, of uh, cinema cameras and um, you know higher end productions and needs. And we've kind of got these um, just kind of out displayed to, to help visualize a little bit. Yeah, of kind of a little, what we're talking about. little example of it. Um, so we, we were racking our brains on how to or where to start. Um, you know, describing you know all these or, or where to start when you're about to to, to pick a camera for for your production, and, and we will definitely preface that your production itself is what's gonna dictate um, what camera you're, you're gonna choose. Um, Absolutely. And, and even uh, client preferences and things like that. Yeah. And like sp on a specific level, but also on a general level. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's production by production basis, or project by project basis. Kind of. We just uh, shot for, for ARC, for Adorama Rental Company, we just, uh, they already had a, a promo video commercial for, for the company and they wanted to cover their uh, Brooklyn uh, location. Yeah. So they had already had a commercial shot or whatever and and they just wanted like extra footage for that. So the first thing we did was, okay, well give us a list of everything, that, how it was shot, like what camera, what lenses, in order to try to match it. That production itself, you know, made us, you know, pick and choose a camera for that specific thing. So it's always gonna be like that. Uh, and we'll go over like the different aspects of that. Um, but yeah, in terms of where to start, again, we were thinking where to start and I, what we both uh, ended up, uh, where we landed on was, you know, size and weight. Yeah. You know, the, the physical size and weight of a camera um, is important and it's gonna change uh, like the way you do things. Yeah, the, like the requirements of the production, um, how much space you're going to be shooting in, uh, is a, a huge variable. You mm -hmm. know, um, yeah, you can kind of see a, a quickly with these ones, like how the size difference between them and, and the weight is is definitely uh, equal to the size difference here on on these. These two, it doesn't look like there's a huge size difference, but uh, when you have them fully rigged up to the way that you normally will say are, are shooting them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a cinema camera, maybe not specifically the, the, the Red Series, but cinema cameras in general uh, tend to be a much bigger rig, so. Yeah. So, for example, um, again, the, re, re, depending on the physical requirements, like we were saying, so, <clears throat> Uh, right now we have a, a Sony A7S with a uh, manual uh, Canon FD lens here, and this specific camera is able to, you know, you are being able to r just run and gun with it, um, you know, shoot, you know, from the hip, as they say, um, and it doesn't require much. And whatever, whatever, you know, accessories and, and appendages you're going to add to it, uh, it is going to stay pretty minimal. And it is not always the case, but at least with uh, with this specific camera. You know, you're talking about like stabilization on camera, so we can put a manual lens like this or like other cinema lenses which don't have uh, in lens stabilization, yep. and you'll be totally fine. Um, when you grow, uh, when you grow from this to a, a broadcast or more uh, professional camera, like it, again, you grow not only in in size, but a lot of the appendages. 
uh, are already part of the camera, which you right. do not have with like a, a smaller mirrorless, for example. Um, things like ND filters and stuff things like, like that. Things like ND filters, uh, you know, this in this specific case with the, uh, the C200, uh, you're talking about a, a viewfinder uh, uh, and a, you know, side monitor uh, as well. Obviously, the weight is going to um, increase, which technically helps stabilization. Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, a, a bigger, heavier camera is generally easier to stabilize when you are hand-holding it. So, yes. So if you think about the, the axis, right, like the more the camera moves on these axes here, right, it's so much easier to get that little bit of wiggle going on with, with something this small. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, to this guy, the, the size and weight of it makes it more of an effort to actually turn the lens. So it helps with stability yeah. just by the physics of it. And ergonomics as well. Yeah. Like these cameras are made, are made to be uh, held uh, easier than, um, you know, for, for video or for film production than something like a mirrorless camera. Right. Now, how, do, how does, again, A, B translates to C for something like the cinema? Um, we're watching a bare bones uh, uh, red right now, basically just the brain, a monitor, and a lens with a battery on the side. You would have to rig up this camera quite a bit uh, in order to get it to to the level of uh, uh, to function some, uh, to something where like the C200 is already basically as rigged up. It's probably missing like a microphone here, but you got all the basics already in camera. Um, it's definitely going to be more compact than a fully loaded red. Right, yes. And again, that yes. also adds weight to that uh, and, and becomes where you need more physical requirements, not only as a camera operator, where you're handling more weight, but also in the types of different rigs that you're operating. So if you're going to put it on a... Um, on an easy rig, if you're going to put it on a, on a stabilizer like the Moby or the uh, Ronin, um, or even a tripod. Like a fully loaded red, you, you are going to need a, a more, ro more robust tripod that you would um, just a, a regular C200 uh, as loaded as you can get it. Yeah, and, and it's not just the legs themselves that have to support the added weight, right? But also the uh, tripod head, right? Because a, a fluid head works best with a certain range of camera weights mm -hmm. and once you balance it on there uh, making sure that your you know rigged up camera is within that range is going to get you the most smooth motion exactly and and again you you need to think ahead of everything you're going to need for your production in terms of all the accessories that are going to be loaded up and then take that final weight and add that to whatever uh, tripod or rig you're going to you know adapt it to um, Best camera for beginners. Um, again, depends on the production. Because I could say a uh, small camcorder, or I could say, again, DSLR and mirrorless. Uh, really depends what you're aiming for. Um, which one are you going to learn? If you're, again, if you're aiming for, for cinema, for production, and, 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 and that style, I would probably recommend a, a, a DSLR or a mirrorless. Uh, I, I think you're going to learn more uh, in terms of how um, you know, exposure, you know, works uh, because you're, you're dealing with all the, 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 the photography terms and you're dealing with f-stops and shutter speeds and you're dealing with, with, uh, with the same details just in a different way that you would a higher-end cinema camera versus a, uh, with an entry-level DSLR or mirrorless versus an entry-level camcorder, I would say. Um, so it really depends what you're going for, but um, again, if you're leaning towards more cinema more uh, detail and technical production, I would, I would, I would say an entry-level DSLR or entry-level uh, mirrorless camera, for sure. Uh, you want to take on battery? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, basically we're, we're kind of in the this kind of categories uh, that we have laid out here. Uh, to give a good example of the differences, a little bit of feedback, the differences with the batteries, um, so with the DSLRs, right, and mirrorless cameras, you've got this little battery here. Um, mirrorless cameras, it's a little bit smaller than, than DSLRs, but it's very small. 
And, and they're generally made for, I mean, obviously, even the mirrorless cameras, when you really think about it, they're made for, for stills first and foremost. Uh, so the batteries that come with them are usually not uh, capable of, of holding the charge for video for more than you know an hour or two total. Um, and then with heavy use, I would even say 45 minutes. Yeah, and, and, and you, you also have to kind of think about the, which we'll get into in a, in a little bit, but like the Kodak and compression and, and like all of the, the other stuff going on in the camera, right? Like a, a more robust camera is gonna require um, more power, which means that the, the batteries are going to drain faster, so it's gonna require a bigger battery. Yeah. Um, but you see the size of this guy, and then you compare it to, uh, to this one here. So this is like your um, kind of Video. Yeah, like videographer slash more entry level cinema uh, camera, and you see that the battery is substantially larger, and it'll get you, um, you know, for a batteryless size on this camera, it'll get you a little more than than double the battery life or so, uh, which is great because for this particular camera, we're we're gonna we'll get into it, um, but for this particular camera you're probably going to be doing a little more run and gun. They're great for that kind of thing, like documentary and stuff, where you, you may be uh, to, to stop and, like to stop shooting and change batteries can be a hassle. Uh, it's good to have a big battery like in the, the camera already. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the cinema cameras, this is a really small V-mount battery that <laughs> yeah. we've got here to show. We got the smallest V-mount battery one, one we of them. find. This is a, a, Sony, a Sony one, but, but um, you see that the, they're much bigger, and they do get much larger than this. Um, as far as thickness goes, you know, two, three, four times as thick on average uh, for these batteries, and they usually slap onto the back of the camera and, uh, you know, with a, a mount, obviously. They slap onto the back of the camera. This is going to require like much larger, like much more space to charge them when you're working with these um, and storing them when you're not. Like, so you can't just, you could throw this in your pocket, but these not so much usually. And just like we were saying, um, which is like the main theme of how we started, size and weight. Right. You know, the more power you need to, to run your camera, the larger the battery needs to be, the heavier it is. And again, it adds up, like all the, the, the weight of all the batteries, and sometimes some of these are stackable where you have like two, three uh, V-mount batteries or gold mount batteries stacked of, of each other in order to run for longer time. So you have to right, you like know, piggybacking switch. Them. Yeah, as you're piggybacking them, so you have to switch uh, batteries less and less. Um, it all adds up in terms of weight. Yeah. So again, another thing to consider. Um, but much like, uh, I guess computers are basically, you know, it's like uh, a more powerful uh, like processing system in the camera is going to need more power. Yes. So even with these bigger batteries, though not the silly, even with these bigger batteries, uh, you know, you're still, not, it's not like, you know, four or five times the, the battery life. Yeah. Uh, it's usually something like this size will still only get you you know, an hour or two, Around. depending on the camera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's something to kind of keep in mind. This this would probably be about uh, about an hour, yeah. hour and a half. An hour 20, if anything. I'm, I'm not gonna hear. Um, so again, just like it adds weight, what uh, size and weight, the other thing that a lot of people do not think about is that it adds cost. Yeah. Why? Because um, if you're, let's just say we're renting on any scenario, or even if you're buying, um, like we said, you know, the, 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 the bigger the, the, the rig, the more accessories you need to get, the heavier it gets. Uh, it's not only unwieldy, but then you need a heavier tripod that costs more money to rent or buy. Uh, then you, you need other uh, accessories and you need to rent more batteries that are extra heavier and that are, again, a little bit more higher end, so it becomes more uh, costly as you go um, versus, you know, the smaller uh, the smaller cameras and the smaller rigs. So everything grows not only in, in size and weight, but also in cost. Yeah. So very important to always keep that in mind. 
Uh, we have a question if uh, if he should start. Um, sorry, should I prefer filming a short film with a DSLR or a Sony AX53? Um, I would say a DSLR again for the same for the same reasons that you are choosing lenses. You are you know choosing how you're gonna approach it from a from a cinema standpoint. You're making all the choices uh, ahead of time. And if I'm not mistaken, the AX53 is more like a like a camcorder, uh, where your your choices are limited. I always say every time we do a either a dialogue day or or anything related to cinema, um, it's all about intention. It's all about choices. It's all about what you want to achieve, where you want to get, and choices and intentions help you get there. Yeah, and that said too, um, if and it's not always the case, but if a camcorder uh, like, is less expensive to you than the DSLR system or whatever, then you know, get what, what's in your budget. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to shoot at all because you can't afford you know, the one camera that you've been you know, dying to get or whatever, Let, you know, shoot. That, that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, no, so. most important than anything is, yeah, shoot. I'm not saying don't shoot <laughs> if you don't have a DSLR, I'm saying uh, shoot in spite of that, but if you had the choice, yeah. I would probably go for, for a DSLR first. Um, you want to move on to lenses? Uh, well, also the, the civilization kind of a little bit on, on that. Sure. So um, kind of like to, to show you a, another difference between these sizes, right? So it, it, we're, we're kind of showing you, it, it might seem like uh, well, these are all going to be positives for going the small route. Um, but we'll be getting more into the back end of it, and as to in a little bit of why, um, you know, why you you would prefer something bigger, you know. So, but uh, as far as stabilization goes, um, it's you know a lot of DSLRs and mirrorless cameras have really good uh, stabilization in them. Uh, it's tricky because some some it's that you can like the the lenses and systems are really really designed for stills, and still stabilization is not the same as video stabilization. So uh, in those cases, while it might help you a little bit, sometimes um, stabilization on a lens will not necessarily be you know as beneficial as you might think. Um, so it's it's something to, to kind of keep in mind, but. In general, it's it's super easy to get a, a very stabilized uh, shot with something like this, like a newer mirrorless cameras uh, that have you know, especially like in body stabilization and stuff like that. You know that that's um, it's just another way to cut costs in a way. Yeah. Uh, when you get into bigger rigs and you want to stabilize the camera, like let's say we want to stabilize this, uh, and we still want to be able to, to be moving around in the scene fluid yeah then we're probably going to move up to like a steady cam yeah. or an easy rig or a shoulder rig uh, I, i've i mean like this this t type of camera is very often put on shoulder rigs um, they're they're very well designed for that mm -hmm. and um and kind of the larger heavier camera is again helping with stability on your shoulder um, so if you if you see like shoulder rigs for designed for DSLRs, they they tend to have all these counterweights on them and everything like that, which is just like they're adding weight to try to get it to the level of stability that something like this would already have. So it depends on the the like method of stabilization that you're looking at, uh, as far as you know what camera as well will be better for that. Um, yeah, because a lot of people don't realize that um, you know higher end cinema cameras don't have something like, again, like the S7S has in-body stabilization, and some of the other DSLRs have like your lens stabilizing. Yep. Um, these guys have none of that. Yeah, and when it gets to, to, um, to like a bigger like steady cam system, sometimes it's actually easier to work with, with bigger cameras with even with those systems. Um, the ones that are designed for that camera, like that level of camera, I guess I'll say, that's kind of a caveat. So like, there are steady cams designed for uh, DSLR systems and mirrorless systems, but they're usually very bare bones, and like there's no uh, monitor on them or battery system because the camera is so light 
that the rig can't have all this extra weight for its accessories on it. Otherwise, it would destabilize itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so having a more uh, robust camera usually results in being able to, on the other side of the rig, have all kinds of accessories that is nice to have. Um, but yeah, so as far as lenses goes, um, you want to talk about lens mounts first? Sure. Right, like a big difference. So again, advantages and disadvantages of uh, different lens types and mounts. Um, on the different spectrum, I want to say uh, um, on the smaller mirrorless and DSLR, uh, specifically on even on mirrorless, you have a lot of flexibility of what lenses you can mount to it. Um, because of the, uh, you and you always need to, to make sure that the um, sensor. The, the, uh, the flange, flange, flange distance. distance, thank you. <laughs> See, this is why I have Daniel Norton here, just for consulting here at the, uh, <laughs> at the front seat. Uh, yeah, the flange. You need to measure. You, just, you need to make sure that the flange distance works with whatever lens uh, mount you're going to be working with. Um, There's actually, if you want, like online. I think even on Wikipedia, <laughs> like for yes. somebody to like quick look to see if you know. There's like lists of the like literally if you just do search if you search for um, for focal flange distance, mm -hmm. then it, you you'll see the lists and like at every flange distance that every lens um, has. And if your system is below that as far as, like it has a smaller flange distance, then you can, there should in theory be an adapter out there. Yes. <laughs> in theory, sometimes it's like a one or two millimeter difference and you just can't get the metal, it, like it's super hard or even if you can, it's just not, you know, uh, strong enough to, to withstand the forces and you wouldn't recommend it. But um, yeah, I mean, being able to put like, you know, older like Leica lenses on and stuff like that, like stills Leica lenses yeah. and, and, um, and the like is beneficial, you know, as far as Adding extra options for your your yeah, you can look. play around with a bunch of different looks with a uh, like things that are going to give you like more um, or more specific to each lens and and and, and its lens as a com uh, as its own composition versus uh, you know cinema cameras that are more uh, rigid and that usually only take uh, one or two mounts. Yeah, yeah, cin cinema cameras usually have. Um, usually the, the standard is going to be PL, right? There are several, we'll say, variations of PL. Mm -hmm. um, like Ari has, you know, I think LPL yeah. and, and is like one of them. And I think they have like another new one that just came out with their new cameras. But, uh, but PL is like, you know, kind of been this cinema standard for a while. And there's growing because there's a lot of, I don't know, crossover, we'll say, mm -hmm. especially with, with Canon having these cameras and having their own cinema lenses that in EF. Yeah. There's now crossover where you have like this. This is actually a, a locking EF mount. Yeah. So it, it locks like a PL, but it's actually it'll an EF. Take a, it'll take a EF mount. Yeah, it's an EF flange. Lens. Uh, so th there, those are the most common, I would say, yeah. uh, lens mounts for cinema cameras. Yeah, and, and again, on the other side, you have something like uh, um, like the Sony E-mount that you can almost adapt almost any type of lenses. You can get your old Leica, your old uh, Olympus, your old Nikon, uh, and still have like Canon, still feature Canon, and other, and other lenses, will, which will give you more flexibility. Um, yeah, I wanna actually go back to this, this question on here. Um, so they're asking about, um, you know, shooting a, a scene on a car where the, the camera is on the car door um, and mounting your camera to the car door is very tricky, actually. Um, there are car mounts out there, like Matthews makes some pretty good ones, mm -hmm. uh, their, their mounting system. Um, I would say if you're using a car mount system um, with the suction cups and everything to, to get it working, bare minimum, bare minimum, 
of three points of contact is what you're going to want, right? Like you're going to want the main, uh, kind of like a main force, right? Which is usually your, your vertical, and then a couple of side ones usually is the, is the way to go. Uh, but three points of contact, so, so for those of you who don't know, the, the Matthews car mount system is essentially these suction cups that then have rods um, that terminate in quarter 20 or, or 3 8 um, screw. And you'll have to either mount them to the different screw holes on your camera or to, to get a cage or something and uh, use that to, to mount the system into. But uh, those are, are, are super useful if you want to get that, that one kind of car mount shot. Some, some people will, uh, will just use like a stabilizer, you know, and kind of hold that, like have somebody hold it out the door, yeah, depending on the shot, um, or, or rig that in a way. But when you get to a larger camera, um, then that's when you start wanting to use like speed rail and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that um, in order to, to so you'll have to kind of build a little bit of a truss on, on the side of the car yeah. uh, or under it to, to help support the camera because you'll have a much bigger camera and as, as nice as those Matthews uh, one uh, systems are, they do have a weight limit and if you're, you're driving down the street at 40 miles per hour or whatever, you don't want your camera that's attached to suction cups essentially to be overweight. So it's um, just something to kind of keep in mind. But I think that with that question about it being with the little camcorder, you should have no problem with a system like that. Cool. Uh, going back to lens types. So Again, as we were talking about lens versatility and, and everything, you, you now each each one of the cameras and lenses right now can adapt almost to any camera depending on which ones you're doing. So you will be able to to do a photography lens on a red, as well as you know like a like a newer cinema lenses like you have like the Fuji nons, uh, yeah. like which are more like broadcasting more more cinema style lenses on. Uh, on a smaller camera. Yeah. So then the choice becomes, again, like, like we said with the production, what do you need and what are you looking for? Um, are you looking for something that, you know, you need an electronic lens to, to do autofocus for you, like you could on the C200 or like you could on the Sony system? Or do you need something that is going to be completely manual and you're gonna have like every like minimal uh, inch of control to it because you are controlling, you know, the, 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 the full diameter of the either zoom or uh, focus on each lens. Yeah, like uh, how big is this production, right? Um, if, if you have a larger production and you can afford to have an AC, uh, an assistant camera, um, operating your, your lens basically for you, then um, having cinema lenses is great because everything is much more uh, repeatable. You know, you've got these hard numbers, they're on the side, you twist the lens the same direction every time, it's always ending in the same spot. Uh, so, you know, being able to market and everything, it, it's just, uh, you know, using a follow focus and things like that, it's uh, a much more exact system, but uh, obviously it will require somebody to keep an eye on that and to, to, to deal with that. So if you, if you don't have somebody doing that, then again, going, Smaller and smaller. Uh, they have a question here. Um, could you compare a GH5S to a C100 Mark II? Yeah, I mean, again, the, those are essentially kind of two different categories, right? We're looking at it's something in this category and something more in this category, right? Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm also wondering if they're asking in terms of like, you know, one shoots 4K, the other one doesn't. Well, that's, that's true. Yeah, and, and again, we go back to requirements, whatever you're gonna, uh, the whatever you're gonna need. The is a newer camera too. Yeah, so it's a newer camera, it's gonna have other it. options that it's not, but you go back to relying on what is a production need, 
Uh, does it need, if it needs to be 4K, then the, the only choice would be the GH5. Uh, yeah, that's your choice. Yeah, does it need to have, you know, it really depends on whatever you're like shooting and depends on what you want to cover. Um, but and again, that said, you could make a, a, a DSLR or, or mirrorless work like a cinema camera need be. Uh, and vice versa, if you can strip down a RED to its bare minimums, it's not going to work the same, it's not going to be able to be used the same way, but you yeah. could go handheld like you would with a DSLR or like you would with a mirrorless. So there is some, you know, exchange in between both of them, but it's, you know, it really is going to depend from each one. Yeah. Um, so kind of, I guess, jumping into what are some of the reasons why you would want to go bigger? Right? We, we, most of the things we're talking about, it seems like it's... Uh, just the physical attributes? Well, but also it just it seems like a little more, let's say, positive bias towards the, the DSLRs and mirrorless, right? Uh, in, in, in a way, right? Because a yeah. lot of these things, uh, when it comes to size and weight... No, they're it's, lighter, it's, they're easier to carry around. Daniel yeah. doesn't like to carry heavy stuff. <laughs> but it's also like it's... Uh, you know, you can have a smaller production with them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so one benefit of going with a more robust camera is frame rate options, you know, and resolution. Uh, so kind of in a way, like, for example, these guys all do 4K, mm -hmm. um, but these two, there's more options as far as what resolutions you know, aspect ratios, things like that you want to shoot in, um, and the individual frame rates, right? Like you can shoot at, you know, 24, 25, 30, 60, and 120, Yes. right, with this, uh, this particular camera. Uh, a lot of newer DSLRs, mirrorless cameras are starting to add more and more frame rates, but at the same time, if you compare brand new DSLR and mirrorless cameras, you should be comparing them to brand new cinema cameras to see that variable. Uh, and you would see, I mean, cameras like some of the some of Red's offerings, where you can go between one and you know 420 frames per second yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, and just being able to dial it in, like fine tune, like okay, maybe we want you know 75 frames per second or 83 frames per second, and you know you, you've you've found for this particular scene the the exact speed that you want this shot to be. Um, and same with the resolution. You know, the RED has 8K cameras yeah. uh, out, so, and, and, and beyond, you know, that, that's like, it's, a, it's another beast sometimes on that level. Uh, so if you, if, again, if your production requires, you know, these higher speeds, uh, higher frame rates in 4K and stuff like that, um, you know, like, do you need 120 frames per second and it's in 4K? Okay, then now you're, you're narrowing down, uh, you know, what camera that you need for this production. We're being asked, uh, without any bias, uh, which would be each brand's strength in terms of color uh, among uh, Canon, Panasonic, Sony, Red, and Ari. In terms of color? Yeah. They all look kind of similar color to me. <laughs> No, that's not. That's not. They're all, no, I don't think they mean physical uh, color. Uh, I think they mean sensor. Gotcha. And what it captures. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> that was a dad joke. I had to do it, right? Yeah, you got to uh, do it. Okay. At least one Jack bo uh, dad joke for. Yeah, for no, no. I stream. think um, uh, honestly, when you're when you're shooting with digital cameras. Uh, especially if you were, let's say, shooting raw, right? Then, um, then the color is up to you for the most part, yeah. right? The, the sensors don't really, like camera sensors don't really change the color too much, um, like how it picks up the color. A lot of, a lot of the, the great color that, that people really like about a particular camera or camera brand is actually in their uh, color science, which is usually the color space and uh, and kind of the profile that they build, right? Like the, the gamma and everything, the gamma curves uh, that they design for the cameras, and, and it's software yeah. side. You know, it's it's like 
not necessarily something in the camera so much as this is a preset that we make our, our footage look like. Um, so it, for me, I, I, I mean, anything that shoots raw is going to have great color because <laughs> like, you can make it whatever you, you want it to be. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say, I mean, that's me being... Well, not only unbiased that. about it, actually. Yeah. Well, uh, even though it not seems only, like a non-committal. And not only, <laughs> I know, right? And not only is that your opinion, but then, what is color to every one of us? Right. I mean, it, then it becomes taste, and you know what I think is good color. You might think. And it's and not, honestly, and it's it's again another production by production basis. I mean, mm -hmm. some sometimes I I'll be doing a production that I'd rather have this, you know, higher contrast and like you know, set, super saturated reds and blues and stuff like that. And sometimes I want a little more subdued uh, because I, I need a little more range or I know that a particular element in the scene is going to clip or something like that and it's just going to not look good. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the scene and the production for me. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to give a like brand breakdown. No, Dave, <laughs> tell us which one is the best color overall. <laughs> No, but yeah, it is a good question. And again, a lot of it is, I want to say, just left to taste. Yeah. And to, depending on the what the production needs to be. Uh, what do you want to cover next? Uh, oh, so sound is also another thing, that really. So again, kind of going with these smaller ver and versus larger cameras. Um, you'll notice that a lot of larger and cinema cameras tend to not have a lot of audio inputs or they, they won't have built-in microphones and stuff like that. So, so it's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And, and the DSLRs will have built-in microphones, but they usually only have like a single... Like a quarter 20. Uh, yeah, or well, a uh, 3.5 millimeter yeah. uh, jack on them. So, yeah. so then... I don't know why I look. <laughs> so then uh, the, these guys seem to be the most robust, right? That this kind of videographer slash entry level, yeah, broadcast slash entry level cinema uh, cameras tend, tend to be like, we'll say best placed mm -hmm. with that. Um, but there's reasons behind it, right? So obvi the obvious reason why this doesn't have a couple of XLR inputs on it is they're kind of small cameras to put that big of a port on there. I mean, you look at the XLR port on this, to put two of those on one of those, it's just, it's going to be tough. Really, really tough, right? Yeah. Um, and then you do have a couple, I believe the, I don't know if the new GH5 has it, but yeah. the Panasonic did have like a module to have XLR okay. inputs they do. to their. Yeah, so it's an, it's an, an added wireless. accessory essentially. So it's another thing you'd have to think about. Um, they're great if you're doing single microphone setups, uh, like wireless mics going into the camera. Uh, which we do all the time here for at Aroma TV. But um, if you have multiple mics going into one camera, it can be tricky. You'll have to have one of those um, something that will do it. There's something that's in between. Something yeah. like, you like know, Tascam like a, makes something that goes under the camera that will allow you multiple inputs. But, but or even something like a like an old uh, H4 we've done. You know, yeah. where it would take a couple of different inputs work essentially you know as a, as a funnel for for all the inputs and then go you know throw it out to just one source which would go into the camera and act as act as its own uh, you know preamp through it as yeah. well yeah and and then when you look at these guys you, um, the built-in preamps are usually better than the built-in preamps of DSLRs um, and so that kind of also means you're going to get a little bit cleaner sound um, but if you're going through another system like a recorder or preamp go before going into the DSLR, then you should have similar uh, sound quality. Um, I would say that sound technicians will be able to tell the difference, right? Like, but um, most of us uh, probably won't, you know? It's kind of the, the, the trick on it. But so, so these have that system, and part of that is that it, it's able to be this kind of all one around. man, yeah, all encompassed, one man shooting kind of system. Um, where you don't, you just set it up, and you don't have to think about all these things kind of going on around it. Yeah. Um, cinema cameras tend to not have, like this one, um, 
I mean, this has like a little kind of three, three yeah, point five the, millimeter the input. Also has a three point five millimeter. There is an adapter that'll give you XLR for this, but um, when it comes to cinema cameras, we tend to not use microphones into the camera except for like scratch audio, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're doing, when you're at this level of production, you probably have somebody recording sound, right, separately from the camera, and usually that sound is not being put into the camera in any way. Um, usually you'll have like a microphone on the camera in it that just lets the, the editor be able, uh, be able to yeah, sync the two um, a little more easily. Uh, but that's partly because when you've got it on here, if you're shooting the camera, right, and you've got microphones plugged into this, you can't monitor the audio so well and uh, you know, focus and compose and, and yada yada, move yourself around and, and interact with subjects. So it it's becomes, uh, you know, how, how much control do you actually want, right? And when you're dealing with a cinema camera, it's all about, yeah, we want every little bit of control that we can possibly get. And, and so, another person for each department to control that, you know, aspect of it. Right. So, so the sound person will definitely, you know, be dealing with sound. <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, sensor size and cropping. Yeah. Um, so in general, most cinema has been Super 35, like the, mm -hmm. I guess the, the biggest standard when it comes to digital cinema. Yeah, I know. Which obviously is um, to keep the, the sensor sizes are to be super similar or as close as they could get to Super, to super 35 uh, or 35 millimeter film, uh, which is kind of the main slash first kind of big motion picture film. Uh, there w there's 16 millimeter, which is another thing. Uh, so that's 16 millimeter is a smaller uh, film size. And one of the benefits of a lot of these cameras is that you can actually because you have a large sensor, if you can mount those lenses, the 16 millimeter lenses onto these cameras, then um, you can essentially fill the frame uh, with, with those lenses. Yeah. So even though the image circle is smaller, right, they're not made for as big of a, you would vignette if you couldn't crop down, basically. Yeah, um, and a lot of people are used to um, full frame now with DSLRs or with certain mirrorless. Um, I don't know, to me, it, it always adapts to like, well, what's the difference between 60 millimeter, super 35, or full frame? It really doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, that it gives you a certain look uh, is relatively up to debate. Um, it, yeah, it, it, honest... it affects how you have certain lenses, because certain lenses are made for certain uh, sensor sizes or, or, or ratios, but other than that, you know, you, like the, the image itself doesn't really, um, affected in a positive or negative way to me. Yeah, I mean, the way that I like to shoot actually is if I go larger or smaller with the sensor, I still tend to be as close to my subjects as, uh, you know, I'd normally do. Like, I don't, I don't change my distance because of my, my um, image sensor size, which means that my, you know, compression and depth of field is usually the same what I'm gaining for a larger sensor is just a wider frame, you know? And, and so that, to me, that's like just the way that I shoot and, um, and kind of, I think, puts in perspective, uh, you know, the differences. But I, like, I do like uh, even like the 16 millimeter lenses. Like I have that, the Ingenue. It's yeah. uh, so like a 12 to 120 at, at a 2.2, you know, that's <laughs> to be able to do that range, you know, it's cool. Um, so it's, it's just another aspect to think about. Yeah. It's hard to get it on some cameras, but, uh, I think now it's just modern cameras. Most modern cameras will allow you to crop in. If you can't crop in, uh, like, like this guy, it doesn't really have, I mean, it kind of does like you can do like the 1080 window, I believe mm -hmm. in this one, um, in particular, but if you're shooting 4K and, and there's a particular shot or scene that, you know, 
has to use this lens, right? Then um, you know maybe there's room to to crop in to the 4K and get you a 1080, right? Because you also have to think too. A lot of the especially older um, 16 millimeter lenses they don't really resolve that well, you know, as far as like the sharpness to it. So 4K is just overkill on those lenses, and 1080 is more than enough to get the full quality out of those lenses. And you still get that same feel, you know? I want to say half of all filmmaking is workarounds. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. <laughs> Just making it work at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, and then it becomes, uh, I have this set of lenses that, you know, maybe just a Super 35 or just maybe, you know, Super 16, and then you're adapting whatever camera, sy camera system to them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, and so that one's interesting, right? So this is the next kind of thing that we want to talk about, uh, ND filters. Um, so it's, this is an interesting outlier in some <laughs> regard to that, yeah. uh, that it doesn't have it. But generally, uh, when you get to a larger camera system, they tend to have built-in ND filters. Uh, so like C200, the C200 has built-in ND filters, um, you know, some of the larger cameras, like the Sony F series, like the F5, F55, they have built-in ND filters, mm -hmm. and they're they're usually um, for the time that they produce them, they're like the most correct, you know, co like color corrected, you know, uh, that, that you can get, right? Because when you start using heavy ND filters, you start getting infrared um, infiltration and stuff like that, which can cause color shifts uh, in your image. But usually they tend to be really good ND filters built in. So it's kind of another thing to think about too. Like if you're run and gun or you're doing a documentary or something like that, then a, a camera system that has ND filters built in is nice. If you're going inside and outside at this kind of, in the same you know, couple of moments or whatever, then this way you don't have to like change the look, right? You don't have to, to stop down the lens to, and get like deeper depth of field when you go outside. You can keep it shallow. You can just throw the ND up to get the proper exposure and move on. Yeah, and, and again, it, keeps it goes it back to choices and intention. You know, it doesn't, it's not gonna stop you from getting or shooting it the way you wanna shoot it. Uh, it gives you the option to, to, to do that, to have uh, ND filters inside and again, when you were talking about a smaller camera, it's something that you need to add and adapt to that, where something on, on the quote unquote mid-level range or, or, or starting professional like already has, and then to a certain yep. level up, depending on brand yeah. and stuff. Yeah, because well, also too, like the example of like a little bit older with the RE cameras even not having that. And, and, and sometimes people prefer their own ND filters mm -hmm. because of a particular flavor of ND that they want to use. Um, but also, too, like it's kind of one benefit of learning on a, a DSLR or mirrorless system because you're you're going to be using a somewhat similar system to putting ND on it as you might with a, a larger cinema camera um, because there's more things that you would n necessarily want to put on there. So not just ND, but maybe you want to do some you know diffusing filters or um, like skyline filters and stuff, which people use uh, for photography a lot. Uh, less so now, but yeah, polarizers. So especially polarizers, circular polarizers in particular, but yeah. <laughs> um, so connectors is a big deal. Again, going back to uh, comparing a smaller camera to, to your medium and, and going to cinema cameras. Um, you can only fit so much on uh, on a little mirrorless or a DSLR, and usually the connectors or peripherals are really really small. Where you have like your like your micro HDMI's and your uh, very small um, very uh, very small uh, USB connections uh, uh -huh. and, and audio connections, versus something again on the pro level where you have every connection that you need quick access to them and that are going to last and are going to be um, professional standard where you can get to, let's just say, any event and they're going to have a, a BNC connector to, to match your camera. Uh, they might not have that little micro uh, HDMI. HDMI specifically that you need for your, you know, 
camera well, and plus proprietary. SDI cables, you can have a much longer run of them uh, than quality. HDMI without losing quality. Uh, but also there's things that, you know, even bigger than this, right? Um, when you start getting sync uh, and gen lock and stuff like that, you know, time code and all that. Uh, so when you're doing multiple cameras for a production, so having those connections, uh, having access to them is, is useful for multicamming as well. Yeah. So another big important thing that we wanted to cover was uh, data. Yeah. Data and, and workflow. And for, for those that are not familiar, you know, workflow is uh, everything, ones, you know, how you're going to manage the data that you have from when it leaves the camera all the way to, you know, wherever it's going to end up, if either it's YouTube or some sort of like, uh, you know, tape or however you're going to distribute tape. Totally dating myself there. Mm -hmm. um, so workflow is important and uh, workflow is going to change uh, from camera to camera from, from your, you know, your lowest um, dominator and, you know, just uh, very compressed, uh, you know, footage to your fully raw, um, completely uncompressed footage that you might get from each camera. Um, do you want to start with like the media types? Sure, sure. Do you, you, you did a lot of log and capture, right? Uh, I was... did a lot of log and capture yeah. back in the day, yes. Yeah, that's, that's for, again, for those who are not familiar, they're just happy to put a, an SD card in your camera and then an SD card to your computer. Um, back in the day, we, we shot on tape. So, you know, you literally had to, to, you know, press play and record from the beginning of the tape to the end of the tape to whatever you were um, recording in order to, to make it digital. It's like, um, it's like cassette tapes where you used yes. to like press play and record and to transfer. Exactly yeah. like that. Yeah, just going into the computer that way. Yeah, and uh, I was lucky enough to at least be to where we converted that, that to digital mm -hmm. and then just keep it as a digital file afterwards. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, didn't do storing, uh, VHS to VHS was... edit, editing, but start and stop. Transporting the tapes was a pain, right? Yeah. So, so now with a lot of newer cameras, the, the media is so small and rugged and easy to work with com compared to back then too. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of, of kind of dispute among the brands as to, to be like a standard, right? Everybody wants to make the, the standard. new standard. Um, but whenever, like, anytime somebody comes in with, hey, we have the new standard, they're just adding to the pile of, <laughs> of standards. Uh, There's a few that have stuck, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we are looking at two of them right now. Uh, th these two both have SD card slots on them. Yes. So, which is interesting that this is using SD cards, um, mostly because DSLRs, at least, I guess the current ones mm -hmm. uh, are because they've kind of moved away from compact flash and now they're more what SD C fast and XQD. Yes. Right. So and mostly I want to say overall <coughs> C, uh, SD cards. Yeah, you see for the higher models. You see mostly SD cards. SD cards are, are less expensive than the others. Um, they're smaller and thin, and they've been around longer in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but XQD and C, C fast are faster media, mm -hmm. right? So the cameras that use those uh, can have l bigger files, right? Like larger codecs and stuff like that uh, because you kind of hit a limit, like you kind of hit a limit with uh, SD cards, right? With the, the kind of data throughput. Um, so that was like one limitation, right? With the 4K on the, the mirrorless cameras. Yeah. When that had like just started coming out, you started seeing like, oh, well, you have to get, you know. Certain speeds. Certain speeds and stuff like that. So it was just kind of something to keep in mind. So if you're, you're doing production on a mirrorless camera or, or really anything that's using SD cards and you're shooting 4K or a larger codec or something like that, just make sure that the, the cards you're using are up to spec for the speed that's required. And it kind of varies from camera to camera, but um, they have like these UHS numbers and stuff like that. And, and U3 is usually like U1, U2, U3. Um, and so you, you ideally want to get the fastest card 
possible. Mm -hmm. But the, the megabytes per second number that's on the card is not necessarily its uh, video recording speed. So that's where kind of those other uh, little names come in, the ha come in handy. And, and on the back of the, the packaging, they usually say what they are. Yeah, you know, the information. Yeah. Um, and as you grow with, like, with the cameras, you grow with not only the size of the media from a small SD card to, to something like the, the red mag, but you also grow in... Um, so you can see the, the slot. <laughs> right, on the side. I like playing with, with the multi cam. No, yeah, let's good. go to. Uh, there we go. There we go. See that right there. Um, it's a little bit bigger. Yeah. Although it's, it's not not uh, not quite like a computer hard drive. Not, no, not quite. That, not that size. So still kind of small in a way, but but bigger than the SD cards and C fast and. But as you again, as you grow in, in size of the card, you grow in size of the data. And then yep. you go into, you know, you know, managing the data. Then you go into, well, you know, given your, your codecs and given the, the, the size of the footage, uh, you're going to require more hard drives. You're going to require more space, um, depending on, on, on not only, like, a bunch of aspects, including resolutions and codecs and, like, everything you're going to be playing with. Um, so again, another thing to keep in mind, because that also influences cost. If you're going to be doing a job where you're going to be shooting, you know, a red and, and at a certain uh, compression, you're going to require way more um, storage units than you would with something like uh, like an A7S II. Yeah, and I th it's part of of the the design process that the companies you know did when they made all these cameras, right? Like. Uh, Sony, Panasonic, Canon, Nikon, and all them, they, they know that, um, that they're using this media, right? And that their camera processes at this speed, so we can only give you this much of a file, basically. Um, which is actually kind of, in many regards, really beneficial. If, if you're doing a quick turnaround, you know, how the files that, that come right off the camera, um, there, you could upload a lot of times, right? Just straight to like YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, where you know the the raw video on something like this is going to require processing, uh, much in the same way uh, as stills. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and it it also becomes a managing the files in post production becomes uh, ease of use. Yeah. Like not every file is gonna. Uh, be able to be managed the same way yeah. uh, and also depends on whatever system you're going to be using and we have a question here um, in regards to post-processing like what is the is there any software package that we would recommend or if it just boils down to personal choice Would yeah I, I mean um, in a way yeah it's personal choice some uh, production companies use a particular software, and if you're working with them, then you'll be using that, right? But uh, if you're doing more of the, your own production or, uh, you know, like independent contract work or whatever, then use what, what you're comfortable with, what you've learned. <coughs> I'll, I'll say that, that for the most part now, the, the big three, we'll say video editing uh, softwares out there right now, um, which is Premiere, Final Cut, and, and uh, Avid. Media Composer. Yeah. Uh, they're very similar. Like they have their their pluses and minuses to each other, but the way that they they operate now is so much closer than it used to be. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of like I, I recommend that if you're going to be getting into editing, you're doing if you're doing a lot of of uh, independent production and you're going to be editing that, then I recommend. Uh, at very least, learning all of them. You know, if, if you can, like if you're in, in New York here, you can go to classes, and uh, they're usually pretty inexpensive to just kind of like get get an idea of like how the the software works. But if you know, if you have to make the choice, it kind of also kind of comes down. I mean, it's preference and budget on some level, right? Like technically, if you're keeping it for 
like two years, for example, then Final Cut is going to be the cheapest option of the three, and uh, Avid Media Composer is going to be the most expensive of them. But Avid Media Composer, in my opinion, has really, really good file management built into it. And if you're doing a lot of productions, uh, it's just super beneficial. But if you're also doing your own um, graphics and, and um, and kind of like motion, you know, motion graphics and stuff like that, then uh, the Premiere is also very good because the, of the interoperability with After Effects. Yeah, with After Effects and Photoshop and everything like that. You can just drag and drop the files in and they work. And you can, from one application, open the other. And, and so for that reason. And it really depends <laughs> also on, like you said, on budget, but. Um, and where you are in production. I know that uh, Avid, I think, just released their free version of Media Composer, which I haven't tried. Um, oh, yes. Sir. But again, because I don't know if you're barely you know, learning or you're barely uh, starting to, to see which one you want to lean into. Again, a free option is always going to give you the option to just play around with their universe, as, as you will, and, and, and see if you like something like that. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions on Facebook that I had not seen until now. Uh, which of the DSLR cameras shoot RAW? I'm yeah, like, nothing, none at the moment, right? No, in terms of video, no. We no. say at the moment, like, sure, something will probably happen, unless, maybe. Unless, unless, uh, and I'm not condoning this, unless you use a Magic Lantern. That's true, that's true. You could probably push certain cameras to, to do raw. And, and if you, you consider it that same level of camera, like the earlier Blackmagic, like the pocket camera and, and all right. of that, Again, uh, those shoot raw. That does give you a little extra flexibility. And actually, we're kind of getting that segues into, uh, into the codex in, in a way, right? Like the, the like shooting raw, in and of itself does not mean that, that you're getting more uh, information, mm -hmm. right? Like because of dynamic range of the camera and stuff like that. But it, it does have a lot of advantages uh, sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it, it's got... And not all RAW is created equal. Right. So that's, that's kind of one thing that uh, I was going to say is that the... Uh, like the, the Blackmagic RAW is, is cool because you can you know, adjust your ISO and white balance and, um, and, and the like, you know, some, some levels of, you have some levels of control. You can open the RAW in, um, in uh, DaVinci, mm -hmm. right? Which will give you this kind of full access to the, the RAW files, like controlling your, your highlights and shadows and the gamma curve and, and color and, and everything like that. Uh, but if you were looking for a quick kind of way to just stretch more information out of your footage, um, it can be a little bit tricky, yeah. especially if you're just dragging the files into um, like Premiere, for example. You know, you, you get the basic exposure and white balance adjustment, and then that's it. Uh, recommendations for... Uh, amateur filmmakers regarding anamorphic lenses? Um, as far as the lenses themselves, or? I'm guessing. Because camera wise, I mean, there's a few cameras that do this kind of like. In camera. Uh, yeah, like the, G, the GH5 and, the, yeah. and all that. Um, but lenses, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tricky so for, they're not, for. They're not for a bunch of reasons. They're yeah. not uh, cheap. So it really depends where you are as an amateur filmmaker in terms of like what can you do budget-wise, because usually anamorphic lenses are not cheap. But then you do have the um, uh, SLR Magic has the a, SLR Magic has yeah, a inexpensive an inexpensive fish. adapter that you you can add, like add some of their like a you can make some of their lenses uh, into anamorphic lenses given that lens adapter. And I think there's an old uh, Panasonic adapter as well yeah. that compresses the image to make it uh, But there's a problem as well. with using those in that uh, you're, you have to focus multiple separate lenses right, at the same yes. time, where um, a more dedicated anamorphic lens, like purpose-built anamorphic lens that you'll see on a cinema camera, it's usually still just a single focus. 
Trevor from the chat also says that the digital Bolex also shoots raw. If you that's can true. Find that's true. Yeah, they don't sell those anymore. Like they they were really cool. Another they were really interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting camera. Oh, so I guess on the other side of of, of the raw methodology is, is with like red, for example. One reason that I like uh, working with red cameras for post production. Um, is that Premiere natively supports like everything about it, right? That, like they've worked that out. You can literally change the color space and gamma and um, and fine tune the gamma curves to, to your liking, uh, which is great. And it's something that you can do with like RE cameras in a way with um, in Premiere. But but like so like a higher level of cinema camera, even the the kind of we'll say basic uh, video editing software is able to access all this kind of information that, that you're recording. Um, so it's just another thing to kind of keep in mind. It's like, oh, do we need RAW? Do we, you know, is that going to be super important? I mean, even, even the file sizes of uh, when you're not shooting RAW can be astronomical, right? I, a couple years ago, uh, I'll use the, the anecdote, a couple years ago I uh, was DPing on a, on a production, and we shot uh, 2K 444, right? Um, so we, we basically shot 2K, like super, super um, high, like uh, bit rates and stuff like that. And the the film ended up being 40 terabytes, like just one copy of the film, 40 yeah. terabytes. So. That that page. was, yeah, and that was not raw, right? That was 2K, so not like that was basically HD, yeah, not raw, 40 terabytes, and then you have to, to throw in right because like proper etiquette when it comes to to your production and handling your data is to have multiple backups in multiple locations. Uh, so so this particular film, they had 40 terabytes at the producer's house, 40 terabytes at the studio, 40 terabytes off-site in an online server, and... Uh, it adds up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of another thing to think about is file size. Um, big file size, I mean, if, if your production needs that, right, needs the, the, the added detail, needs that, that raw capability, go for it. Just keep in mind, everything it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely recommend that whatever you shoot, even if you're doing small events um, and you're shooting on a, a DSLR or mirrorless camera, to, to do that, like to back up your, your, your footage on site to an on site backup as well as an off site backup. Yeah. Um, whether it's the, like a copy of your footage is at a relative's house or apartment or whatever, or it's on a cloud-based, you know, server system uh, that you have. It's it's a good idea to have that because if you back up everything and it's all of your data, all of your footage, uh, including all your past productions, is in your apartment and there's a problem, a flood or a fire or something, and you've lost that, it's just catastrophic. Yeah, so, and if it's a job, that's money. Yeah. So you got to be careful with that. Um, depending on, sorry, uh, the, right yeah, the, the... Public domain sources for music? Yeah, so there's a question online about uh, public domain sources for music. Um, depending on your, your final output, like, like where it's going, um, that also kind of comes into play. Like if you're doing videos on YouTube, YouTube actually has their own music, kind of public like public domain yeah. for use. Um, there's several sites like, was it Incomtech? Yeah, I'm trying um, to remember which ones. Which does that. I actually recommend, even though it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's spending money on this. I recommend spending money on, on music. Um, and so like, what we like to use a lot of is Artlist. So artlist.io. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of subscription service that uh, when you basically just find music on there that you like and that, that matches the mood. It's got mood, style, and everything like that, different categories. 
Uh, it's pretty good for that, actually. Um, I use, used to use a lot, now not so much, but the Free Music Archive. Yeah, yeah. If, the if Free you, Music Archive is really, really good. My, my problem with a lot of the, the like free public domain stuff um, has always been, though, that it's, it's so generic sounding, mm -hmm. which is kind of the point in a way. Um, so if you are looking for just kind of this general feel or whatever, and, and you're, you're giving this to, uh, to somebody who, who doesn't do production, then that, that kind of stuff is useful. <laughs> For sure. I want to mix two questions here oh. uh, from Emily Chang on Facebook. She says, which lenses are your favorite to use and why? And uh, Sarah from uh, YouTube is asking, what's the best lens, uh, best lens for filmmaking? Mm -hmm. And for me, favorites are going to be tricky. Um, but I do like lenses with a lot of character. So kind of going back to like my Ingenue lens, mm -hmm. uh, I really like that. And I, I have as everybody around uh, knows. I, I have a, a 90 millimeter L, uh, Leica Elmar lens. Elmar. Yeah, that's, there's something off about this particular one. So it's not that all of them are like this, but it's got uh, one of the, the elements, the lens elements is a little messed up. It's really messed up. And, and it looks so nice. It's just so <laughs> creamy and, and smooth and, and it's still like, focuses properly. Seth would hate that lens because it's no, really no, it's, not sharp. It's sharp. It's sharp, but it just gives this kind of, it's just got this like softness to it, which is, I don't know how to describe. And, um, but no, I, I, I like doing that. And then as far as like kind of roughing it up to using different filters or creating your own filters or things to put in front of the lens, um, like using, uh, like fishing wire and stuff like that to get the kind of like almost anamorphic flares and stuff. Uh, it's just, just playing with them, you know, playing with what you've got. I, I don't, I don't see, uh, I mean, there's lenses for filmmaking that have made things easier for me as far as like, I don't have to think about the lens. Um, and so those ones I like a lot, but I don't have favorites in that regard. You know, something, yeah. something like the, uh, the everybody can, kind of goes back to the the Zeiss CP2s, you know, because yeah. but but I kind of feel like the those ones have a little bit of character to them, uh, the, the differences in them and the the subtle or not so subtle difference between those and other series of lenses is just kind of not as as um, as versatile, yeah, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's it's hard to. It's like the classic thing that everybody that's everybody that's not a filmmaker always asks us filmmakers, "What's your favorite movie?" Not a thing, like not a thing. I don't think I I don't, I don't think I've ever yeah. met a filmmaker that said. I mean, yes, they got inspired by a certain movie or a certain movie got yeah. me to do this or got me interested in that. But I don't think anybody has like a, 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 and I might be completely wrong on this, but I don't think they have a favorite movie. This is my favorite movie. Uh, I would say the same thing like with cameras and lenses. I don't think you have yeah. a favorite. You might enjoy working with some uh, type of lens or, or, or certain types of camera. Um, on a particular day, you might have a favorite. On a particular day, I might have a favorite. <laughs> this, this was the perfect lens for this shot in this film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and, and best lens for filmmaking, uh, again, I think it goes back to, to that. Like. Um, Every filmmaker has like a like a little love affair with, with uh, with different types of uh, of lenses. Uh, yeah, the, the Coen brothers love their wide angle lenses. Yeah. love their wide angle lenses. Um, Focal lengths I usually tend to be normal or a little bit on the wide side, like you know thirty five millimeter or 24, 18, 16 millimeter, somewhere in that range. I'm like a little bit on the wide side, but. And it, not crazy, it, but they're so. all but they're all tools, and you know sometimes you're gonna need a uh, 90 millimeter, sometimes you're gonna need yeah. a 16. So it really it, 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 you wanna you know um, uh, deploy these tools uh, for whatever you wanna portray, whatever you, feeling you wanna achieve. Um, but they're tools nonetheless, so you, you gotta try to use them as wise as, as wisely as you can. Yeah. So now uh, this this of course has not been. Um, 
very specific, right? Like, oh, this is the A7S2 and this, you know, like these are the, the features is why you would want this specific one. And that's partly because there's, there's actually so many variables in this and everybody's gonna have their own uh, feeling on it and, and everything. So, so it's, it's tough to say. It's like, if we were to give a very specific camera, right, um, for, for a, a, a particular purpose or whatever, then there would be somebody that's going to, to say that, no, that wouldn't be the camera that I would use for that. And that's because of preference. You know, it's kind of part of that. Talking about that, what uh, camera you would use, uh, they're asking, what about documentary? You know, a run, a run and gun possibility with DSLRs, or should he use a uh, camcorder? Yeah, ideally, I mean, it depends on the, the documentary, right? And how they want to shoot it. Yeah, and how you're shooting it. So, like, smaller, smaller, I guess, smaller production on this, um, you could go mirrorless DSLR. Or you could go something like this. It depends, right? Like if you're going to be, if you're going to be out in the desert or something like that, or you're going to be in another country that maybe you're not going to have access to, uh, to be able to charge your batteries every day and things like that, then I would recommend this in, in a heartbeat. Yeah. Right. But if if you're shooting in your hometown or something and uh, you want something that is lightweight, easy for you to move around, to be unobtrusive, right, in the space that you are, um, then maybe, you know, it's a good idea to go with SLR. The, the reason that maybe is a little bit of a, a flex on this is why I still might recommend something like this, depending, right? Like if you do, although it's not necessarily a documentary, but let's say you're doing a, uh, a wedding event shoot, then I would still kind of lean towards something like this. <laughs> Honestly, for the look of it, like, the look of you having a bigger, more pro professional looking camera um, for the client's sake and, and for the people that are around. Yeah. I, I, honestly, it's it does, funny, but it does it's matter. true. Yeah. It's um, weird, but it's true. Like the, the number of times that you'll have a, a client ask for a particular, like a very specific camera and not necessarily know. No, I, I've, I've been... What that even is. I've like, literally never been, seen one. In, in, I've literally been asked, oh, but you have a big camera, right? There's that, yeah. I'm like, yes. So, so the, I, I mean, there are benefits to, to both, but it's, it's really tricky. I, I do think, uh, like, somebody just kind of put on there the FS5 and, and C100. I think those are, those are pretty good for it, and they're still... They're a little smaller than, like, the C200 is... Um, so a little lighter weight, but they still have a lot of the, the, the features like the battery and, and um, you know, kind of all the controls that you might need and, and options. Uh, so, so yeah, <laughs> if that helps. Uh, any suggestions on where to share your footage to get honest and professional comments on your work? Oh. Is it, uh, it's always difficult to get a professional to look at your work. Yeah, it's, it is tricky, right? Um, so... If you want a lot of eyes on something, just in general, YouTube is like the way to go, right? Yeah. But as far as like a professional to critique your, or to look at your, your footage and actually give you uh, constructive criticism, um, Vimeo has been pretty good for that, right? Yeah. I mean, I haven't been on there for, for a while, but uh, I remember like I used to, to, to do a lot of stuff on there. And, and a lot of it is community. I mean, yeah. um, different Facebook groups, uh, uh, forums, Reddit. I mean, you gotta essentially you gotta look for uh, your people, uh, and you know at at those different levels of you know starting professional to you know other different professionals. Um, there's also like you can you can go to classes and, and establish relationship with with people that are that do this professionally, and and I, I, in my experience, they're completely open to. To tell you their honest opinion on what you might be doing right or might, what you might yep. be doing wrong. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from here yeah, from here. the audience? We answered everything. They don't have a single question. Uh, this specific one is the uh, A7S II. Yeah, and the, the newer camera for Sony's line is the A7R3. Yeah, it's the last one. Which of has the, some, this some style. 
we'll say improvements over this for, for video production, like a bigger battery um, and stuff. A few things that'll, that'll help with that, but. You, the young man uh, in front. I made a mistake because I walked away with it. Are you talking about the Avengers moment? You missed everything. You missed everything. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can just go home now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any rumors Thanks, for NAB? Yes. We'll rumors. never tell. We yeah. might be there. We, we might be there. We, we might actually be the, the NAB um, covering the the, the, the announcements and, and everything. Yes. So. Um, you won't hear the rumors. You'll hear, hear the live thing as, as soon as we find out. Yeah, we can't tell you any rumors. <laughs> no, we cannot. <laughs> Um, anything else before we wrap up, guys? And red, is it that uh, every year it's changing, or? Yeah. Every year everybody's changing something. Yeah, uh, there's I would always say, a new camera from, from almost every company. Yeah, yeah, they, they do have stuff. They, they, they actually have, so the question for people online, the, the, the question was, uh, with red, is it every year that they're, they're changing? Um, they actually have, a couple of main body types, right? Um, so there was like the this this kind of version here, and then they have the the, the two, right? Which which had some changes. Or actually, this is the two. Um, so so like they they've made some changes, but uh, it kind of throughout the course of them having this type of body, which has been uh, a number of years now. Um, they've only had two specific body types where, where like the accessories are not in, so interoperable. Uh, so it's not so bad as it might seem. I mean, they'll, they'll have a bunch of new cameras and they all share all the same accessories. And, and if you are starting out with their like entry level camera, like the, um, the, the Raven right now, for example, uh, a lot of the accessories for that will work on the the, the like weapon and, and uh, you know kind of further up yeah, the, the helium and all that. So so if you are getting into their system, then a lot of the accessories now will still be able to be your accessories. And they've they've actually come out and said that they, I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but they they said that there was I think like a five year plan or whatever where they're like we're not going to change it. So like we're there are a certain number of years they're guaranteeing their customers that that they won't change it. So all the accessories that you buy now will work. Yeah, which is useful. I mean that's that's super yeah. useful to have. Uh, I mean these cameras are a bit on the high end and a bit more expensive. So you do kind of like oh but I want to make sure that all the accessories, which is usually like the cost of another camera, like you know uh, that they'll continue to to work for you for sure. So that it's it's nice to to hear that they they are making that commitment. Yeah. Now. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming, guys. Um, our next event next. Shout your social. Shout your social. Okay. Your social. Sorry, Seth is teaching uh, us how to be an influencer. Um, oh. The. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So you're welcome to follow us on social media. Uh, at uh, Dave Ruska and at Film Fernando on uh, all social platforms, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't forget to follow us and subscribe to Adorama TV here on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, what events do we have coming up? Thursday, shooting with umbrellas for me. Yes. Uh, Thursday. Daniel has on Thursday shooting with umbrellas for uh, those filmmakers. Yep. Those filmmakers that want to shoot photo or other photographers that might be watching this. You'll see me there as well. Now what? Yes, yeah, we do, do use umbrellas in filming. I didn't say otherwise. But you're shooting photos that day. Uh, light is light. All right, Seth wants us to wrap up. So thanks for watching, guys. And if you have yes. any questions, drop them, drop them on the comments below, and we'll see you next time. Yeah. All right. Ooh. Thanks for coming, All right. guys. I was looking at the wrong camera.